Um, let me ask you something specific, though, because you talk, you said a lot of these things are beautifully crafted, et cetera. I want to go back to the Florida one because I think this is the fundamental flaw in all of this, is that when you start introducing specific things, right, when you say 1619 Project, there's no end to this. You can, there's a million other things that are probably worse than the 1619 Project that people can do an end run around these laws by teaching. The thing that is constantly brought up, and you brought it up probably four or five times, is the idea of teaching that one race is superior to another or there's some sort of inherent guilt or something. Okay, let's say that we get rid of that from, you know, from, in a legislative way. These teachers still exist. And you don't think that the hyper-woke teachers are going to find other things to teach that aren't that, right? All you have to do is to teach things that are factual, you know, as it says in the, in the uh, Florida law, that are so heavily skewed to one side that only teaches about slavery, only teaches about oppression of Native Americans, only it teaches about redlining, only teaches the bad stuff in American history. That is still not illegal under Florida's law. You lose. Correct. They win. If they are half a fucking, you know, have half a functioning brain cell, they will know how to very quickly do a, an end run around this stuff, which is why it makes me think that most of this stuff is very much a culture war, political posturing thing. Stop uh, teaching the 1619 Project. It all goes away. We all, you know, dance around a rainbow holding hands. No, because if you want to get rid of this stuff, you're going to have to start making lists of books that are like the 1619 Project to, to not teach. Because I'll tell Although you what, even, even that will fail. E even the ideas don't go away. I, yeah. But there's no, easy I, ways of teaching, quote unquote, woke stuff when even if these laws are in place. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, I personally, again, uh, per this is a practical political thing. I personally would not include any specific titles to say, hey, you can't teach from these titles. I don't think that's the best approach. Um, I think that it is um, it, it, it could be perhaps it would require a constantly updating list right and i don't like the idea even just from a just from a kind of uh, uh atmospherics perspective the idea of creating a list of books you can't read i don't like i don't uh -huh. think it's the best approach i <laughs> think the, the better way approach. again <laughs> yeah. is the is the is looking at the pedagogical techniques and concepts uh -huh. and then shaping those in a series of principles that can then be tested against specific works or specific worksheets or specific items. And yeah. I think your your point is 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 half right. I would say the half that's right is that, well, these, you know, these these teachers who are committed to this are going to find some ways to bring it to the classroom. Yeah, there's probably some truth to that. There may be deeper structural reforms that are required. But the part that is that is half wrong is that um it's like this idea of we can't win now because we need to keep losing later. You know, it's like well, you, you know, it's 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 pessimistic. It's a bit fatalistic. I think that these are very important tools. I think they're going to change the game. I think they're going to empower parents to a degree that they haven't been empowered. And I think just the fact that we're getting parents showing up by the hundreds of thousands, potentially by the millions, that are actually even just the act of showing up at the school board meetings and caring about what's in their, going on in their children's schools, just that is such a tremendous force for good. Because people are invested in the institutions. They're invested in their kids' educations. They're invested in the idea that they are the ultimate authority over these bureaucracies. And so I think that we give them the tools, we craft them to the best ability possible. Um, and then we go on to the next stage. I mean, this is not like a one quick fix. You write a two page bill and the problem of, of public education in America is solved. I'm not saying that. I think that's, that's naive. I think it's, it's, it's incorrect. But I'm saying that this is a very important first step that has motivated millions of people to get into this fight, but it's merely a first step. And I think that there are much bigger uh, and bolder and more beautiful uh, ideas to pursue subsequent to it. Well, I, I, I didn't have an expectation that we'd resolve our our differences of I think we did didn't we resolve this, this afternoon <laughs> <laughs> this evening but yeah. but I I did I did expect us to have an interesting and spirited conversation and it's it is very interesting because I think we agree on the destination here it is a, a universe where parents families have greater educational choice that they have schools that perform better there are many school systems that have a long history of failing children. You see these horrible, heartbreaking stories of a kid in a Baltimore school who's graduating and they're near the top of their class and they've got like a 1.2 GPA, just obnoxiously bad stuff. And 
my position on this is very much not that we should embrace a strategy of losing, but to the extent there is this anger and resentment that's already out there, harnessing that in a way that is actually effectual and making certain that we're not doing it in a way that is fueling an endless cycle of culture wars. And it sounds like, it sounds like it is already the case today that in certain places, people are passing legislation that goes further than you would like, and at least have an impulse to do things that go further than you would like, because they believe that things are perhaps worse than they actually are, that the stakes demand that they begin to explicitly target specific bad ideas, not merely trying to achieve specific kind of better pedagogical approaches to education, not merely trying to achieve broader policies that deliver broader choice to parents. And I'm using the word merely there to make it sound more attainable. I know that that's hard work and really heavy lifting, but it seems to me that a broad cross-section of parents could be in favor of both of those things, particularly the, the pedagogy thing. I can imagine a world, and I know this is crazy, but I'm going to say it anyways. I can imagine a world where Chris Rufo, Camille Foster, and Nicole Hannah-Jones are all advocating for a pedagogy that is geared towards giving students the you. tools needed <laughs> yeah. to navigate complicated conversations Ooh. and graduate as better informed potential citizens who are prepared to like inherit, I believe inherit the this children beautiful the endowment of knowledge <laughs> <laughs> and, and to have like serious conversations and back and forth about important issues. I, I have to believe that's possible. And it's hard for me to get excited about a, a culture war that feels a lot like the Tea Party in, say, 2007, which, I mean, where is that movement now? Where is the critical race theory ban that the Trump administration it, it pushed in their executive order? Like the chief accomplishment of that is it sort of raised the temperature on these conversations, but it was immediately rolled back. And yeah. the way it's castigated by its opponents is – these people are fucking racist. They're unwilling to talk about slavery and segregation in schools. They don't want to tell the truth about history. I don't know that we're helping if we're supercharging the two sides in that distinct way. It just, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to reach the goal you and I both want. I didn't bring this up. Cause it's not, it's not uh, comrade Rufo's fault, uh, obviously that when I went to one of these, uh, school board meetings, the first two people I talked to who came up and gave presentations, uh, one of which, uh, quoted, uh, uh, Chris's, um, New York post article, uh, neither of them had kids. Um, mm. one was in oh, his seventies really? and had, didn't have kids at all. Uh -huh. And I realized a uh, really lovely guy. And I, I realized that he just loved Tucker Carlson. He was like, watch Tucker all the time. And he was like, this is the issue. This is the thing. And so when I asked him what was going on in Florida, specific examples, he didn't really have any. And I know people throw that at you, um, you know, and I know that Mark Lamont Hill, et cetera, and you've had these debates before, which I don't, I mean, for my purpose, what I took from that was, was that it, it was a Tea Party type moment that was actually rallying a lot of people who were no longer um, going to stop the steel rallies. Two people that I met at school actually were in uh, uh, the Capitol on January 6th. And they're really, and one of them got kicked out of the school board meeting, started screaming and yelling. And they're really, really passionate about this. And it's just like, it's a new issue for them. And again, this, I didn't present this to you because this has nothing to do with the stuff that you are doing. Um, sure. but it does, it, it, it is coming, it is becoming that kind of issue right now. And you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of worries I can imagine from your perspective when it gets way too political and way too partisan and way too sort of Trumpy. Uh, and it kind of, you know, undercuts you in some ways. You get the last word, Chris. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not worried about that, actually. Um, you should be. <laughs> and I, I think that, <laughs> not, not at all. I mean, and, and, and I think for two reasons. One is, to, to Camille's point, it's a lot of people, the kind of, the smart interpretation is to basically say, oh, the culture wars are are a distraction. They're they're pointless. They're not productive. They're, you know, they turn into kind of partisan kind of conflicts that never resolve. Um, my point of view is quite different. I think that the the kind of cultural battles are fundamental and foundational and, and incredibly important. And they're never totally disconnected from uh, structural concerns, like how do taxes work? How do public institutions work? 
Um, those two things cannot be unlinked. Mm-hmm. Um, they are the, the, the kind of the fact and the value are are so deeply intertwined. You, there's no perfect technocratic solution to these problems. These are problems about human behavior and motivation and values and principles. And we should absolutely clarify them. And I think when I see people revolting against these ideologies of critical race theory, um, yeah, I mean, they might not know every nuance. They probably haven't read Derek Bell's collected works and, you know, they, they couldn't trace the ideas back to Marcuse. But, but they are American citizens that are, are engaged in the process of politics and want to reform those institutions. And the Tea Party, you know, wins and losses, but I think did have a lasting impact on the country. It brought in a lot of good people into office. Uh, it changed American politics, not in maybe all the ways that I would want or or to the extent that I would want. But but I find it strange that we would be in this environment where people are protesting in school board meetings. And somehow that seems to be beyond the pale. When we had six months of riots, looting, arson and destruction that had even less of a coherent political philosophy behind it did much more damage and actually left people dead. And we're supposed to also believe at the same time that somehow that was uh, the kind of correct way to engage in a racial reckoning or Mm -hmm. racial politics in the United States. I I think there's so many built-in, kind of baked-in double standards that I feel none of those concerns you outlined. I feel unapologetic about this. I think it's the right thing to do. And um, I think we should go hard at it. I mean, like... Let's do this. These are our children. These are our tax dollars. These are our institutions. And people are standing up and fighting. Um, I think it's, I think it's amazing. I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think as someone who has tried, who's really kind of brought this issue to light, to me, it's like, it's kind of astonishing. It makes me feel very optimistic. It makes me feel hopeful about the country. If you shine the light on a problem, uh, and you do it with sufficient, uh, Kind of strategic vision and sufficient factual evidence and a, and a and a sufficient narrative framing, you can change how politics in this country works. And I, I think it's just it's heartening. It, it 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 shows me that there is a heartbeat of people who oppose the same ideologies that I oppose, uh, and that we can actually inspire them to action. Damn it, Chris. damn it, Chris. Damn it, Chris. Am I wrong? You, Is that, you guys no, agree, you're, don't you're, you? You're, I mean, it was too eloquent. It means too eloquent. Gonna, I saw I have to Camille, become a, just cut a fucking liar. Just cut it out. <laughs> and then just yeah, put Joy Reid. I'm going to become a liar. Yeah. Just, yeah. I just, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lob one small, it's small, never small sound at you this time. No. Isn't that, it's Jesus never small, Christ. but I'm going to try. Your life is about to divorce him, Camille. You said. Do you remember the last word? not true. Do you remember the last word, the phrase that you used? I know. I'm going to give you the last word. He still got the last word, but I didn't say which one would be the last word. You said the culture war is never fully disconnected or totally disconnected from kind of these core issues in our, in our society. And I think you're right about that, but I also think that they can be more or less well connected to some of those core issues and values in our society. And you and I have been involved in conversations with people who in the process of debating sort of the appropriate approach to these issues have said things along the lines of, um, I thought I was a free speech absolutist, but I'm sorry, I'm not. Those tactics don't work anymore. And I've heard you yourself describe, or at least read um, recently, we talked about this as well, where you talk about the inability to persuade zealots with logic, facts, and clever arguments. They only understand the language of power. And there's more to that quote, so folks can go look that up. I think there, there are people who are abandoning not merely kind of the the commitment to or specifically the commitment to the legal notion of kind of free speech as it's constitutionally protected but they're certainly abandoning a commitment to this notion of kind of a culture of free speech where the goal is to be able to debate these ideas out in the open because the belief is that it's hopeless now like something has fundamentally changed we can't do that anymore. Those rules don't apply any longer. And 
I could be with you where I'm excited about people at these school boards up in arms, ready to do something because people are doing something that they feel uncomfortable with. If they were aiming at a different basket, if they were aiming at the kind of pedagogical reforms that you've talked about here eloquently, and if they were aiming at choice, as you talked about here eloquently, but when they seem more inclined towards the belief that we're sort of teetering towards inevitable like race wars, as some people do, and that we have to vacate particular principles in order to safeguard the polity, like I worry about what's left once you've vacated certain principles and ideals. And now I'm genuinely going to give you the last word. You could say anything you want after right. that. You could even say, yeah, Camille, that's some yeah. bullshit. And I won't say <laughs> I anything think that, afterwards. I, I, I think we probably agree more than we disagree. And I think that... I hope so. And I, I think we have to make a, a vital distinction between the kind of private and civic sphere and the public and governmental sphere. So in a private and civic sphere, I think I'm probably with you, almost a, almost a free speech absolutist. Uh, that you as an individual American have are entitled to the protection of your speech, especially political speech, uh, with very, very limited restrictions. But in the context of public schools, for example, um, there is no, the government does not have free speech rights. Free speech, the First Amendment was not designed to protect the government against the people. The free speech was designed to protect the people against the government so that when we're limiting or constraining or shaping the speech of public institutions, it is a hundred percent political decision. And that I think oftentimes this kind of, uh, uh, a naive, uh, libertarianism can't make the distinction between those two things and, and, and believe somehow that free speech principles should be applied to the government. Um, but government is by essence politics. It's decided it's, it's a way of negotiating power relations. So appealing to principle in an institution that is, that is created by and functions through political power is, 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 is doomed to be ineffective. What you have to do is you have to say, we are going to shape these institutions according to the will of the people. We will encourage a culture of free speech and culture and a culture of inquiry, but we're not going to let uh, ideologues and 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 people who would harm, manipulate, or coerce our kids and violate their conscience to operate with no restriction. Um, and I think that's the right answer to the question. I think it's it it, it involves the ability to separate the two spheres. Um, but I think once you go there and you realize that politics is political, that, that state institutions are shaped by politics, uh, I think you're then engaging with a reality that is, that is more Machiavelli than it is, you know, uh, th than it is utopian, but is, 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 is much more connected with reality. And if you accept that as the baseline, you can make decisions that are going to be actually good for kids and good for human flourishing. Chris Rufo, ladies and gentlemen, just called me naive. I'm going to let it stand. Let it stand. Because you know what the <laughs> difference you. is? Is that every two seconds I want to jump in and be like, man, motherfucker, Chris, you crazy. <laughs> but the reason I didn't is because I'm not Joey Reed. And we let people talk on this podcast. Yeah. You get to hear their ideas. Even when they lie. Even when they lie. Even when they lie. <laughs> <laughs> Agree to disagree. Uh, no, I, I, 